to the next uh, uh, presentation um, by um, uh, Federico uh, Garcia uh, uh, Lammer, uh, who is actually um, um, the uh, associate professor in the Department of Architecture, Duarc of South Dakota uh, State University. Um, where he actually teach. He's also actually the uh, founder or, of an uh, architectural practice uh, called lay, uh, uh, lab uh, slash or labor. So in a way, labor is a very important uh, uh, aspect uh, in his practice. And also he directs uh, a very interesting uh, research program, uh, Forensics, uh, at the studio, uh, uh, the, at the Department of Architecture, where he uh, teacher, uh, which is also was awarded and recognized. So in a way, Federico's work really represents an attempt to introduce these questions of labor, construction, and relationship between building and design in academia as, a, as not just a kind of technical expertise, but really as a, as a pedagogical project to, uh, to address architecture. Uh, and I'm very happy that uh, in uh, his uh, talk, uh, uh, he's going to introduce us to another very interesting uh, figure, uh, Eladio Di Este, who also uh, trying actually to uh, bring to the fore the, the, prop, the issue of construction really as a kind of fundamental uh, datum uh, of the architectural uh, project uh, in response especially to the labor uh, of construction. So Federico, uh, thanks a lot for joining us and we're very much looking forward to your uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and for um, thank you for for including me in the conversation and uh, I'll get started. I need to I need screen sharing to be. Ah, yes, uh, Maria, can we make uh, Federico? I also just wanted to point out that um, the, the Department of Architecture at South Dakota State is is only 10 years old. So it's the first architecture school in the history of the state. Um, so that's the primary reason why why we ventured out, me and my my partner, to uh, South Dakota, because there was um, an interest and also a, a push to to consider the labor and construction as part of the the pedagogical uh, frame of the um, of the school. Can everybody see the screen? Yes. Perfect. So as Pierre Vittorio said, I'm gonna share some ongoing research about the innovations in ceramic armada or steel reinforced structural ceramics of the late Uruguayan engineer Eladio Dieste and his engineering and construction company Dieste and Montañez, which he co-founded with his partner Eugenio Montañez in 1954. Uh, before I dive into the, the core of the presentation, uh, I'll just share a brief story, an anecdote to, to introduce the, the work. About three years ago, the, the Faculty of Architecture in Montevideo hosted a, a symposium titled Dieste Ex Machina. Um, it was to celebrate Dieste's kind of 100th, uh, uh, 100th anniversary of his birth, right, and his work. It was a wonderful event, panels, building tours, exhibits. It was really thoughtful, beautiful, and, and kind of well executed. Um, and one of the highlights of the event was a panel, a roundtable discussion between Esteban Dieste, one of Dieste's sons, a, an architect, and one of the founders of the Dieste Foundation. Uh, Marcelo Sasson, who was an engineer with the Estea Montañez for many, many years. Gonzalo Larambere, who is also an engineer and currently leads the office. And lastly, Vittorio Bergalito, who was a worker and laborer with the Estea Montañez for over 30 years. Um, so to see Bergalito uh, among architects and engineers kind of contributing to a discussion or even being central to a discussion about Dieste's work was striking, uh, but shouldn't really be surprising. And it inevitably kind of... Um, at least to asking how did a, did a worker become included and, and central to this kind of platform dedicated to celebrate Dieste's work. And I think a lot of the answers to that question are, are fairly obvious, but a few are less, less so. And, and those are the ones that I like to, to dive into a little bit more. So I'm going to focus on workers like Bergalito, associated with arguably the most canonical building in Dieste's oeuvre, which is La Iglesia de Cristo Obrero, constructed from 1958 to 1960 in Estación Atlántida in Uruguay. Um, I imagine many people are familiar with it. Um, my intention is to connect the workers of El Cristo Obrero with the immigrant-led 20th century workers' movement in Uruguay by unfolding Dieste's idea of economía cósmica, or cosmic economy. So Dieste referred to economía cósmica as the profound order of the, order of the world. Um, it's a concept, even a, a philosophy that seems 
vast and, and metaphysical, uh, but it was actually grounded in, in very practical on-site organization of workers, the social, financial, and, and political consequences of this organization as well. Uh, in essence, it's, it's really about practicing and designing the, the conscious and, and purposeful connection among materials, labor, ideas, territory, um, and simply shortening perhaps the distance between all these things. It's as ambitious as it sounds, which is perhaps why it was never really turned into an itemized manifesto. Uh, instead, it shows up uh, through bits and pieces in his writing. Uh, but as I'll try to argue, I think it's central to the, to the politics of construction and certainly the practice of Diaz de Montañez. When you hear interviews with workers, when you examine kind of innocuous or, or the managerial aesthetics of documents like wage logs uh, and schedules, I think you, you start to see this cosmic economy put into practice. I don't really want to dwell on, on where the concept came from uh, or its connection to the artist Joaquin Torre Garcia, uh, which Dieste was very close to, but rather look at the labor-based consequences of this idea. So Dieste invented uh, four innovations in steel reinforced masonry, which he called Ceramic Armada, and you're seeing some of them being constructed uh, in front of you right now. Uh, those innovations were ruled surface walls, Gaussian vaults, self-carrying vaults, and folded plates. Uh, essentially, each one of those was based on how to resist gravity through form. Right? And in the first two cases, ruled surface walls and Gaussian vaults, how to use double curvature geometry to resist gravity, right? to develop that kind of economy of material uh, and structure. Cristo Obrero was the first architectural commission of the Este Montañez. So prior to the design and construction of the church, they had constructed a series of agrarian utilitarian structures like water tanks and silos, which was really the context for the start of many connections to local rural construction workers. But in 1950, this marked the, the development of the parochial commission to advocate for the construction of a new church in Estación Atlantia. Atlantia, which you're seeing images of, uh, it's, a, it's a small rural beach town. It's about 50 kilometers east of Montevideo, the capital of Uruguay, population of about 5,000 people, and which was closer to 3,500 in, in 1950. It's a place that really comes to life in, in the summer. Um, the commission was led by Alberto who in 1954, after much deliberation through community meetings, proposals, and presentations, identified Dieste Montañez as the design and construction firm that would carry out the project. So the construction of the church began seven years after the establishment of the commission, following several fundraising ventures and a commitment from Alberto and his wife Aldea to the primary benefactors of the church. So beyond its um, celebrated status as, as a modern icon or, or perhaps its canonical position in South American architectural history, I think there are three primary reasons uh, why El Cristo Obrero is relevant in the context of this particular presentation. First, it's the start of this immigrant-led construction, which would define the construction over over 1.5 million square meters of Ceramic Armada across Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay. Second, it's the first project that combines two of the four structural innovations, ruled surface walls and Gaussian vault roofs, right? Both double curvature geometries meeting uh, together. And lastly, it was built between 1958 and 1960 in between two timelines defined by two different military dictatorships that ruled Uruguay in the early 30s and later in the 70s and 80s. So this last point is particularly relevant in terms of the legislation and, and labor organizations that preceded and followed the construction of the church, which I'll discuss in the, the second half of the presentation. So exclude the archival construction images that you've seen in the first few slides, the other document I'm centering this presentation around is one of the first jornales or wages logs issued in 1958. So from June uh, 1958 to April 1960, there were 12 liquid payments made to Diesta and Montañez, which were connected to workers' wages and payment for their labor. So a close inspection of the wages log from September, um, three months after the start of construction, begins to outline the organization of labor on site. For me, it's, it's kind of fascinating that these kind of labor-based conditions that structure the politics of, politics of construction, they, they live in these inconspicuous spreadsheets, right, in the kind of managerial aesthetics that the Pierre Vittorio was referring to, in these under-examined documents that begin to connect architectural and engineering labor with construction labor, especially in Dieste's case, as his office was in engineering and construction practice. So I'm not going to focus on, on the material sourcing or transportation of materials, but instead on, on the single uh, archival document and workers' interviews. So in very general terms, the log breaks down construction teams that worked on the church. Um, the number of workers was 12 to 15 with a number average number of five to six workers on site per eight to 10 hour shift. 
and a maximum of 15 workers on site at once. Um, or according to some workers, close to 20, depending on the scope of work that was being done at the time. This particular log shows three teams of five, which by all accounts was pretty standard. Missing from the wages log are three key figures who were paid separately. Two capataces or job captains, Victor Retamar and Domingo Peta, and the engineer, Marcelo Sasson, who was the representative and engineer in charge of El Cristo Obrero. He was present during the Diesta Ex Machina Symposium, which I, which I mentioned at the start of the presentation. Um, Domingo Peta's name, one of the two job captains, can actually be found written in pencil at the bottom of the page. Uh, so the workers included in the September log and identified by name in the first column, which is fairly self-evident, um, but it's kind of captivating in, in a way to start to see the exchange and the bookkeeping that outlines the choreography of the site and starts to suggest a specific dynamic between a group of people. The second column called cargo specifies the rank of the worker. Um, cargo is a word that carries at least three meanings or uses in Spanish, I think even more. Uh, all of these meanings implying weight and responsibility. And there are three ranks specified in the log, oficial, medio oficial, and peón. And this order reflects the primary hierarchy and authority on site. So peones were primarily responsible for the organization and movement of materials, from bricks to mortar to wood for formwork, pretty typical role in terms of division of labor that has existed for centuries across many cultures. Medio oficiales coordinated the assembly of those materials and the construction of formwork for the walls and vaults, as you're seeing in the image on the right. And oficiales who were responsible for very specific continued trajectories of work. For example, the coordination of the construction of the walls and vaults, but more importantly, they were primarily responsible for laying brick and setting tile. The capataz or job captain, such as Retamar or Domingo Peta, who I mentioned before, was responsible for overseeing and organizing the work between all of these workers and reporting to the engineer in charge. So it's notable that within each team of five, the distribution between these roles is fairly even. So for example, teams one and two have two oficiales, one medio oficial, and two peones. Team three has one oficial, two medio oficiales, and two peones. So while this perhaps suggests the flattening of site, hi site hierarchy, it, it also suggests the internal training pro program that took place on the site across two years of construction, which can also be seen in some of the archive images and the interviews with, with some of the workers. It's a type of learning that's centered on communication and as several workers have recounted, like Miguel Castan, who was a peon on team two, the role of communication heightened the level of agency among the workers. Communication essentially was defined by the physical proximity and the closeness of space between each worker, which is facilitated by the design and construction of mechanisms such as the formwork and scaffolding for the actual vaults. So the very proximity between each worker, between these teams of five that break down to three, that then start to interact between these different roles, it would allow the ranks to actually change uh, during short periods of time. Castang himself started as a peon and became a medio oficial and ultimately an oficial while constructing the ruled surface walls during his first two months on site and later participating on the construction of the vaults. As I mentioned, the, the ranks would change, which I think reflects the, the increase in skill level and the, the initiative displayed by the workers and also a certain kind of dynamic form of management or seeing the kind of changes that are happening in terms of the, the skilling of, of construction labor. So workers, really in which when issues arose, the oficiales and medio oficiales were very outspoken and direct in their communication. Bergalito, Bergalito emigrated to Uruguay in 1953 and had already gained experience working with Dieste as a medio oficial on the construction of two water tanks before participating in the construction of Cristo Obrero as an oficial. So maybe unlike the kind of silent factories or construction sites structured around the mechanistic ideals of, of, of Taylorism, uh, El Cristo Obrero was, was really a learning site that focused on the increased dimensions of skilled labor. Um, and one of the primary reasons why Bergalito and other oficiales were so integral to the construction of the church was the degree of difficulty associated with the double curvature form of the church, its walls and its roof. Essentially the, the material connection between these two type of curves. <laughs> 
I think perhaps in, in contemporary terms, we, we maybe we associate the, the labor of complex geometry with the, the exploitation of invisible or kind of voiceless uh, labor forces. And in El Cristo Obrero, the geometric complexity of the church was a catalyst for the expansion of the role of workers. Um, in fact, Castang and Miguel Angel Diaz recount other workers in the area taunting them uh, about not being able to find work after the construction of the church because they wouldn't know how to build straight or regular vertical walls. Um, this, of course, wasn't true. Uh, instead of, of kind of complete authority residing in a single leader, there were several leaders in different roles, such as the construction of the rural surface walls and the construction of the former to build build the vaults, which was entrusted to three Italian carpenters, including Vittorio Bergalito, Nicola Tarniello, and Domingo Peta, uh, the job caption I mentioned before, which you see on the screen. So to complement the skill of these oficiales and medio oficiales, this document uh, is really the first wages log to include local workers who only worked during winter because they were involved in other projects during the summer months. And I think this distinction begins to connect the kind of urban and rural workers on the site of El Cristo Obrero. But I'll, I'll refocus on, on the wages log and observe two other categories that broaden the impact of the document and connect the internal politics or organization of the site to the social political context of Uruguay, perhaps highlighting this, this urban rural intersection I just mentioned. So continuing from the right, um, the cargo or rank category, there are other columns that outline total number of hours, hourly wages, each of these reinforce the three ranks I mentioned before, but there are two other categories that I would like to point out and I'll spend more time talking about one. The first one is the Caja de Jubilaciones, which is a monthly contribution based on hours work to the National Retirement Fund for workers. You can see that the contribution is typically higher for oficiales and medio oficiales, but the percentage remains the same across all three ranks. The retirement fund contribution is roughly 10% of monthly wages. The second one is locomoción, which is a stipend for transportation accumulated across the month. Uh, this suggests a few things, but perhaps not quite clear, perhaps an indication of the distance or place of residence of the workers, which reinforces the notion of local workers from Atlantida participating heavily in the construction during the winter, but it's mostly speculative. I think at first glance, both categories seem insignificant, but if the cargo or rank column outlines the organization of the site, the retirement fund column demands to be examined in this kind of mid-century political context of Uruguay. So there are two parallel interconnected histories that unfold why the retirement fund category is important to the politics of construction. I'll explain each one of these in more depth for the rest of the presentation. The first one is really the emergence or the first phase of the workers' movement in Uruguay from 1875 to 1905. And the second one are laws and labor specific acts that address the social security protection from the establishment of civ civic uh, retirement funds in 1904 to the 1957 Carnet de Trabajo or independent uh, workers card, which is connected to the workers retirement fund. So this last law was approved by the Senate and Representative Assembly of Uruguay on, on August 7th, 1957, just seven months before the start of construction at Cristo Obrero. And I'll return to this particular law um, and the workers card at the end of the presentation. The pairing of workers movement and labor laws is fairly typical in the history of labor, but there are some unique things that I think are central to, to Dieste's notion of economia cosmica related to these to this connection. Uruguay is fundamentally an urban country in which the majority of the population lives in urban centers and half the population lives in, in the capital of Montevideo. Um, this was true in 1905 and it's still true today. Uh, this tension is, is embedded in the colonial DNA of the country and the, the bipartisan violence between Los Blancos who are primarily associated with the countryside and the urban-based Colorado party. The Uruguayan workers movement is, is urban like many others but at the time of its start, there were no major industries in Uruguay. Even the primary agricultural sector didn't operate at the scale of Brazil or Argentina. So in spite of its small kind of industrial scale, census records in Uruguay indicate a steady growth in the number of workers with the labor force reaching nearly 50,000 by 1951. So this growth is, is directly connected to the legacy of immigrants, especially Spanish and Italian workers arriving in this part of South America at the end of the 19th century and during the first half of the 20th century. Um, workers like Vittorio Bergalito and others listed on the wages log. So as Michael Gobel points out on, in his scholarship about immigration to Rio La Plata, despite continuous kind of military turmoil throughout the 19th century, 
Uruguay became a destination for European immigrants from Spain and Italy, even before Argentina did. By 1905, the European population of Montevideo was 28% Spanish, 27% Italian, and 22% French. And trade and improved shipping fueled imagination. And in spite of small interruptions in the early 1890s, and obviously during the First World War, European, European immigrants kept arriving in Uruguay until the authoritarian government of Gabriel Terra enacted laws in 1930s, which limited the arrival of new immigrants for close to a decade. Uh, prior to this influx of, of immigrants, the only other movement of people at a significant scale uh, was the forced displacement of approximately 20,000 African slaves at the end of the 19th century, which made Uruguay the primary port of entry of slave labor in this part of the Americas before the abolition of slavery in 1842. So between 1880 and 1930, I think a conservative estimate is that about 275,000 Europeans arrived in Uruguay, um, a significant amount of even the current uh, population. So reinforcing the dominance of Montevideo over the rest of the country, the majority of the immigrants stayed in the capital, uh, making up 47% of the city's population by the turn of the 20th century. So let me, um, I'll, I'll return to that second point, the role of labor laws and acts with, with more specificity. So by 1873, a chapter of the International Association of Workers was established in Uruguay. And you can see some of the, the early demonstrations of masonry kind of sections of that work force um, on the right. Three years later, that chapter turned into the Federación Regional de Montevideo, which in 1905 becomes the Federación Obrera Regional Uruguaya, or the Regional Uruguayan Workers' Federation. That's way too many back to back. Um, I think part of this is this kind of advance and this, this change that happens also based on examples from Argentina, who already had this federation established two years prior. And there was already a certain level of exchange politically between the countries that had taken place for nearly 100 years. Um, within this kind of strong anarchical currents of the federation, as it grew, it began to advocate for the broadening of social protections for workers. And one of the primary efforts was the restructuring of pensions and retirement funds which undergoes substantial changes and swings and setbacks from 1904 to 1957, and especially following the new constitution of 1967. So all of these changes aren't simply reflected in the history of Uruguay, but they're also kind of of deep regional concern. Um, and this is evident in the construction labor session of the Latin American Economic Commission held in La Paz in Bolivia in 1957. So I think that there starts to be a certain kind of overlap and concern about revisiting the agency of 20th century workers across the continent uh, during this time. So the commission studies a series of conditions that are directly connected to the labor history I just recounted, including population growth, migration networks, and the identification of legal or technical barriers facing workers. So three months after the Latin American Commission meeting and seven months before the start of construction at Cristo Obrero, the Uruguayan Assembly passed the Carnet de Trabajo for Construction Workers or Independent Workers Card Law on August 7th, 1957. Until that point, in order to receive retirement or be eligible for a pension from the industry and commerce section of the National Fund, Workers were really dependent on the construction company or the entity they worked for to report the, report the parameters of their labor. If companies did not report the labor, workers were not eligible for pensions. So the 15 articles established by this law hold construction companies accountable for not having workers registered with an independent workers card, which is what you see on the screen. Um, this law began to grant workers more independence and security, while also affecting the flow between rural and urban workers, I think activating in some ways this kind of small Uruguayan territory and spreading the labor-based values established and centered in Montevideo. I think additionally, uh, this overlooked piece of legislation combined with the collective agency of the Workers Federation um, with the micro scale and, and individual agency of the small scale construction scene in Cristo Obrero site. So I think it, in essence, it's through the accumulation of these types of laws that we see the framework for, for the immigrant-led construction sites that define the work of Dieste Montañez during the second half of the 20th century. So really what I'm, what I'm positing is that these small legislative interventions are a fun, fundamental reason why we see job captains like Domingo Peta, oficiales like Vittorio Bergalito, and other workers effectively operate on site and construct with high degree of responsibility the innovations in Ceramica Armada that are celebrated throughout the world. 
Um, I think many of these relationships developed during the construction of Cristo Obrero lasted for over three decades and really defined the transfer of knowledge across dozens of projects. I think more importantly, uh, if we examine this collection of small documents um, and corresponding micro histories, we can potentially expand some of the modern rhetoric uh, to include more cosmic forms of, of labor. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Federico, for this wonderful uh, presentation, which in fact uh, shows uh, the uh, work uh, of Eladio Dieste in a completely different perspective and, and literally brings to the fore uh, the, uh, the workers, the builders, but also the way in which uh, uh, social movements and legislation often really uh, create uh, the framework for really uh, improving the position of builder vis-a-vis -vis the construction of architecture. And I think uh, this is a, a very important contribution to uh, our conversation. So I would like to ask maybe the, the audience if there are uh, some quick uh, uh, two, one or two questions uh, to Federico before we move on. But uh, maybe I, I would like to, 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 to say something, I mean, about your presentation, I mean, how I mean, in which way actually uh, this this work actually inspired your your practice? Because I think it's interesting that you are also a practicing architect and a pedagogue. And is uh, for you really this uh, kind of example uh, a, a way to really rethink uh, the role of architecture in a in in a also society where actually legislation for uh, for for workers, especially for immigrant workers, is actually extremely uh, the opposite scenario that uh, you the one that you you described no i think that's a that's a great question i and i live and and practice and teach in one of the most conservative states uh, if not the most conservative state in the united states um so there are challenges certainly that come with that in terms of legislation in terms of of advocating for particular rights whether it's immigrants or or other uh, communities one of the things that, that I think has really affected um, the way that, that I see practice relative to, to this presentation and this aspect of, of the research that I'm, that I'm doing on Eladio Dieste's work is the involvement that, that my partner and I have with particular commissions in our community. We live in a city where it's 30,000 people. Half of those people are students. And that means that the political structure of the city, it's commissions that regulate how we build, how we preserve, master planning, urban zone, all of these things are open for architects to have a direct um, effect on. So my partner is part of the Historic Preservation Commission and she's been a part of that for three or four years. And it's uh, incredibly dull, continuous work that at the end of the day begins to set up more of these potential kind of small regulations that add up. Um, and I've been a part of also the kind of urban planning and master planning. And, um, and one of the things that I think one of the roles that we've taken is in the procurement process for how to select architects, because the city had no process for doing that. Um, in fact, the process that they had, um, well, wasn't very ethical. So part of our role has been, how do we actually kind of extend all of these ideas that I just described in terms of the DSA's practice into the, the process of, of procurement of architecture in our, in our practice and in our, uh, so maybe getting less work for ourselves and more for others. <laughs> Not a good business plan. <laughs> one question, one or two questions for Federico. Vittorio, can I ask a question? Yes, of course, of course, absolutely. As you have the AA, I actually connected from, uh, from Lausanne because I was interested in the topic. Oh, and I thought that this presentation was amazing in terms of the archival and documentary evidence about practices in, uh, in Diesta's work. But specifically in relation to that, I sort of, um, I, I uh, sort of raise a question with regard to the building industry that was, um, that was in, um, in place at that time. Because I think that sometimes we forget that the Este was not just an engineer, but also had a construction company. And construction companies cannot survive if there is no market. They will go belly up after two years. And it seemed to me that in this particular discussion, what we have not considered is that in fact, Uruguay was a closed economy at the time which means that there was no competition. And so you could actually invest into the factors of production because there would be no one else that would come over 
and take it away from you. And I think that one actually look at the practice of El Adio Dieste in the same way, and we can look at the practice of other architects, engineers, even in Europe, and Nervi is one of those, in which there is a configuration of the market that allows you to actually put in place a series of technology and the development of particular of the use of particular materials that would not have been feasible otherwise. And it seems to me that is one of the reasons as to why El Adio Diestas building technology has become no longer feasible after Uruguay opened its economy after the fall of the dictatorship. So could you say, and I'm trying to tease this some of you, this out of you, that in fact El Adio Diestas world uh, was a world determined by a particular political system and a form of, of, um, of um, construction technological autarky that is no longer in place. I think that's I think that's fair to say, Paolo. I, in, in many ways, what what really happened from 1830 all the way up to 1985 were six different constitutions, and each one of those constitutions, especially from 1952 to 1967. 67, started to precipitate this kind of open economy change that you're talking about. Um, and yes, they really practiced at the peak, if we could call it peak, I don't know if there, there was during this time. At the peak of that economy, of that particular model. And so I think that that's absolutely fair to say. I think one of the interesting things is to see there's just recently completed a, a project by Germán Gil, um, which begins to employ and re-employ some of the self-carrying vaults at a pretty large scale. It's a it's a, a community center in a pretty modest neighborhood of Curva de Maronas in Uruguay. So now there's this, this, uh, this kind of, I think undue tension between the fact that the economy is completely open and it has been since 1985, right? And that there are other materials like the dry assembly, for example, that Hugh, Hugh was talking about. You can see a lot more dry assembly and um, uh, essentially metal stud, which was kind of unheard of, obviously, uh, prior to the 80s, even in the late 90s, early 2000s, you did not see that type of, of construction. And so I think you're absolutely right. I think the invention of the mechanisms, whether it was for pre-tensioning, whether it was for drilling foundations, those were all based on the, the inability to import these things at prices that would make any sense, right? And so, yeah, I think I think that's a that's a great observation in terms of what the market. I, you can follow up. The reason why I made that remark is because I think that may, there is a risk of misinterpreting the um, the increase increasing value put on labor and workers. Which, in a sense, is is a, is a is a consequence, I think, of the of the assurance of the market, of the future of the market. Those workers would not have been in place, regardless of any of any uh, labour legislation, had the market not been there in the first place. In fact, now in Uruguay, one could say that that particular knowledge has been become embedded into a particular type of building industry. But if you actually look at the number of uh, warehouses that have been built since the opening of the economy, they're actually more numerous than the silos, the, the warehouses built by Dieste. But none of them uses the same technological system. They've all moved to dry systems as opposed to masonry ones. Right, completely. Yeah. And the, the labor is there, w would have been there at the time, but no one used it. They changed the technological system entirely. Yes, absolutely. And one of the things in terms of the opening of the economy, I'm sorry, we're, we're, we're probably kind of stretching past that. Please, it's, please, please. It's please. a really great question. And I, um, and it's something I was actually talking about with Jessica, my partner. Um, one of the things that happened, especially, and I don't want to dwell on the 1952 to 1967 transition, but in terms of the market, even though the market economy remained a kind of a close or, a, or as, you, as you're referring, a, a, a not, a, not an open economy. The, that type of governance in Uruguay from, in 1952 was based on this kind of colegiado system, which there was no singular executive power, but it was distributed among nine people. And those nine people weren't able to actually reconnect in many ways to, or the argument is, I think, in some ways, that they weren't able to reconnect to the different ministries, right? So the Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Commerce, Ministry. And so 1967, I think, is a pretty critical moment in terms of, let, let's say, leading to the dictatorship, whatever we want to say, but also in terms of precipitating the changes in the market, because it's that moment where we go back to single kind of executive power. We redirect some of the actual uh, ministries and commerce and industry into much more direct channels. The actual ability to then open up the economy becomes much clearer. 
Um, and that all happens after 1967 and I think really kind of consolidates itself in, in 1985, which is probably not a coincidence that that's when the Montevideo shopping center designed by Dieste was also made, right? So there, there are layers of, of, I think, programmatic conditions and, and market-driven conditions that you're absolutely right. They, they certainly overlap. And it's interesting to see what happened to the shopping center in Montevideo that after it was built was actually changed into something completely different with all the mechanical systems. And so it's yeah. got nothing of what used to be there in the first place. In fact, the yeah. extension is no longer in keeping with El Adio Diestes architecture. At all. At all. Yeah. So anyway, thank you very much. It was a great piece of work.